Hello, welcome to the Rare Books Department at the J. Willard Marriott Library, the University of Utah. My name is Louise Poulton. In this virtual visit to the Rare Books Department, we take a literary journey through the early Middle Ages to the early modern era. Within this long spread of time, Europe and the Middle East developed two major religions, Christianity and Islam, still very much a part of our world today. The advancement of knowledge about the human body, chemistry, and astronomy was slower than we expect today, but initiated revolutionary changes in the way the universe was understood and included an intense debate about the nature of God, the nature of man, ethical behavior, and the organization of the state. Like Christianity and Islam, this new knowledge and the philosophical conversations it provoked are with us today. When we talk about what we talk about, we reach back centuries for a view of the world that still informs our own. The ancient Greeks concluded that the earth was a sphere. They computed its circumference with extraordinary accuracy. In the second century, Alexandrian mathematician and astronomer Claudius Ptolemy disregarded these computations. His error was passed on to medieval geographers with consequences for Renaissance mariners. Christopher Columbus's scheme to sail west to Asia was based on Ptolemy's inaccurate calculations. Columbus figured that China was about 3,000 miles west of Lisbon. The actual distance is more than 12,000 miles. More broadly, Ptolemy adapted the Aristotelian scheme that placed a solid, immovable Earth at the center of things. The cosmological views of the Middle Ages were built upon a synthesis of the ideas of Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Christian theology. The Christianized Ptolemaic universe was a finite one. The map of the world known to medieval travelers was based on one made by Ptolemy. Muslim scholars shared this Greek inheritance and had great respect for Aristotle and Ptolemy. The medieval Ptolemaic world we are looking at here comes from a manuscript commissioned about 1472, centuries after Ptolemy died. It was translated into Latin from Ptolemy's original Greek text around 1390. Ptolemy's text gives a theoretical concept of geography and map-making methods. He includes the names of cities, countries, regions, their coordinates, and gives information on peoples of the world. An atlas with 27 maps, 10 of Europe, 4 of Africa, 12 of Asia, are all ascribed to earlier copies by Ptolemy. This 15th century atlas adds seven new maps and 10 townscapes from later resources. In the century before Ptolemy created his map, the century of the birth and death of Jesus of Nazareth, the Emperor Trajan had his Roman army construct a 4,000 foot long bridge across the Danube. With this engineering tour de force, he defeated the last rebellious holdouts in the Roman Empire. For the next 200 years, the Mediterranean world experienced unprecedented peace new knowledge poured into Rome from its extended empire. Greek and Roman scholars were fascinated with the natural world. They were convinced that an essential unity bound individual and cosmos, and that an understanding of universal truth could be found through the study of the physical environment. One of the most comprehensive and influential ancient texts on the natural world was the natural history of Pliny the Elder. Pliny was a high-ranking official in the Roman army. His natural history is an encyclopedic account of ancient knowledge on the natural world. Pliny discussed human nature and human society, including the biological origins of men and women. He discussed the nature of the cosmos, plant and animal life, and the geography of the known world. Pliny the Elder handed down to the Middle Ages a picturesque but distorted version of the knowledge which had been gathered by the ancients. The West owed much of its facts and fictions about distant unvisited lands to this book. It was this book that helped make lands beyond the immediate frontiers of European Christendom 
looked so enticing. A 12th century Oxford scholar made for his king an abridgment of Pliny's natural history so that the king could make some sense of the contacts made in the markets of the Levant and in the war with Islam. Pliny the Elder wrote that he filled his book with 20,000 facts backed by 2,000 different sources and quotes from 400 authors. We might argue that his work was the birth of the information age, an age that was reinvented and reborn after the advent of the printing press in 1454. Pliny's ancient encyclopedia was first printed in Venice in 1469. Our copy came from the press of Johannes Freuben, who lived from 1460 to 1527. Freuben was famous for printing scholarly texts, in part because Erasmus edited many of Freuben's publications. Our copy contains a wonderful suggestion of the medieval world's presence well into the Renaissance. The paste downs of this contemporary binding are manuscript leaves. Pliny was not the only writer from the Roman Empire whose compiled data informed the medieval world. Pedanios Dioscurides was a Greek military surgeon in the first century CE. He claimed to have traveled widely, possibly with Nero's army. His herbal, known as De Materia Medica, established medical botany as an applied science. The original work described the properties of some 600 plants and a few animal products that were known to have therapeutic value. What made Dioscurides' work particularly valuable was its succinct accounts of the plants described. He emphasized foliage, stems, and roots in the usefulness of each plant. Dioscorides wrote, Now it behooves anyone who desires to be a skillful herbalist to be present when the plants first shoot out of the earth, when they are fully grown, and when they begin to fade. For he who is only present at the budding of the herb cannot know it when full grown, nor can he who hath examined a full grown herb recognize it when it has only just appeared above ground. All illustrated herbals of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance descend from Dioscorides' work. In the 6th century, it was translated into Latin. By the 9th century, it had been translated into Arabic, Syrian, Farsi, and Hebrew. It was an important work in the medical knowledge of the Islamic as well as the European world. De Materia Medica remained the final authority on pharmacology for more than 16 centuries. It was printed in Latin as early as 1478 and in Greek as early as 1499. Between 1555 and 1752, at least 12 editions were printed in Spanish, an equal number in Italian, three in French between 1553 and 1580, and in German in 1546, 1610, and 1614. Each of these editions were printed with numerous annotations and commentaries. In this seventh century manuscript copy of his work, more than 400 plants are described and illustrated. For clarity, the name of the plant is identified in red ink. Romans compiled data and wrote letters. Lucius Seneca, the empire's famous Stoic philosopher, wrote hundreds of letters expressing not the confidence one might expect from a citizen of the powerful empire, but instead self-doubt. Responsible for tutoring the newly crowned teenage emperor Nero, Seneca advocated a life of self-control and detachment. He was horrified, for instance, by the popularity of silk clothing, given that they hid neither curves nor the decency of the ladies of Rome. For Seneca, silk was a cipher for exoticism and eroticism. Yet, for several years before the young Nero was ready to take command, Seneca, essentially running the empire, secretly amassed a personal fortune rivaling that of the emperor, and not so secretly engaged in a rather incredible number of affairs. Seneca wrote several plays drawn from well-known Greek myths. They were gruesome dramas peopled by crudely drawn characters, ghosts, and phantoms. 
and dealing with betrayals of uh, themes of betrayal, revenge, and madness. Privately, Seneca was writing letters that reveal a man quite unsure of himself. In his letters, Seneca expressed struggle against each new ad adversity he faced. In one letter, Seneca wrote, I am constantly at my last breath, and sooner or later, without any doubt, this illness is going to permanently achieve what it's been practicing for years. I cannot, after all, be expected, can I, to continue drawing on my last breath forever. Centuries later, Seneca's words came to life to a mass audience. The advent of printing with movable type in 1454 spread the works of the first and second century across Europe. This is the fifth printed edition of Seneca's works and letters. It includes forgeries and works by the philosopher's father, Seneca the Elder. The printers, Johannes and Gregorius, were brothers who began working together in 1482. They specialized in classical texts printed in Roman types, the choice of most Venetian printers of the time. Venetian printers produced numerous classical texts in Latin and Greek, linking the printing press to the renewed interest in classical antiquity characteristic of Italian humanism and the Renaissance. Venice, an international trade center, was primed to, be, to become the most productive center for the new printing press technology in the 15th century. By 1490, it was the book printing capital of Europe. Ptolemy's Geographia is the only geographical atlas to survive from antiquity. Preserved by the Arab world, it reached Venice, translated from a Greek manuscript, with new maps showing what was then known of the world. Ptolemy's work unveiled the notion of latitude and longitude, the coordinate system that established locations for different lands, mountain ranges, and bodies of water on the spherical Earth. The great Italian polymath Leonardo was inspired by Ptolemy and his Geographia. He adopted the Ptolemaic approach of recording different types of terrain, as well as studying forces of nature such as wind. He used the bird's eye view perspective, which allowed him to chart locations with precision. Leonardo considered his representations of human anatomy as a form of mapping. He, his use of shapes on a linear plane in depicting bodies, most notable in the Vitruvian Man, stemmed from the Ptolemaic ideal of proportional distances. He understood anatomical dissection and the complex workings of the body as a voyage across unexplored lands. Leonardo wrote, Here shall be figured the tree of the vessels generally, as Ptolemy did, the universe in his cosmography. This is the first Italian translation of Ptolemy's Geographia. As the first pocket atlas, its publishers utilized a copper engraving technique which facilitated reproducibility and became the standard in printing maps. Geographia included the first engraved maps of America's coastline from Labrador and Newfoundland to Florida and South America. It contains the first separate map of the Indian Peninsula. In the 16th century, readers of this little atlas reassessed their existence in an ever-expanding world by comfortably holding it in their hands. St. Augustine, born in what is now Algiers, adapted classical thought to Christian teaching creating a theology with lasting influence. His Confessions and the City of God shaped Western European biblical exegesis and helped lay the foundation for much of medieval and modern Christian thought. As a youth, Augustine dabbled in the various philosophies of his day, including a dualistic philosophy of Persian origin. Perhaps a little like Seneca, he struggled with his love of worldly things versus his need for an understanding of the metaphysical. Seneca expressed an existential angst. Augustine expressed a need for God. Augustine became a priest and then Bishop of Hippo 
in North Africa. His philosophy of the world was simple. All humans were moved by either a love of self or a love of God. History, a drama planned by God, centered upon this struggle. The sack of Rome, Augustine believed, was confirmation of Christian teachings demonstrating that even the most powerful earthly institutions would eventually crumble. Augustine's world was God's world. He said, for how can anything done by the will of God be contrary to nature? Then the will of so great a creator constitutes the nature of each created thing. His words rang true throughout the Middle Ages, the early Renaissance, when his works were taught in schools for the elite, and for later church reformers such as Calvin, his works quickly spread after the development of printing. This is a collection of 60 sermons by Augustine, followed by six brief miscellaneous texts. The first 59 sermons have mostly to do with the proper way of life for monks and priests, with some exegetical sermons interspersed. Sermon 60 is on St. Augustine's mother, Monica, a Christian who strongly influenced Augustine's life. This is the second book printed by Paganini. Paganini, born in Brescia, set up his presses in Venice, issuing his first book in 1487. He continued printing until 1490. Paganini was one of a family of printers. He began his print shop in 1485 in partnership but was sole proprietor from 1487 to 1490. He helped two of his brothers set up shop in 1489. They ran their presses until 1499. There is some confusion over books under the imprint Paganini's in Venice after this time. In 1492, Paganini requested permission to print the Bible, suggesting a large undertaking that would cost 4,000 ducats. His Bible was to have a glossary and commentary. This edition was never printed. The same Paganini was the first to print the Quran in Arabic characters in 1517. The edition was ordered to be destroyed by the Pope. In this edition, the printer left the initial letters blank for the illuminator. It was printed in double columns, typical of the earliest printing format. Our copy includes eight leaves of manuscript at the end, an index created by the owner for the book. The fourth century division of the Roman Empire had a lasting and profound effect on Western Europe and the East. Trajan's Pax Romana was no more. In the seventh century, another split set up two Eastern domains, Byzantium and Islam. The West understood Islam only in caricature. Islam was condemned by the Roman Catholic Church as diabolical heresy, in spite of the fact that the Christian faithful who remained in Muslim countries enjoyed freedom of worship and pilgrims to the Holy Land were permitted to proceed without interference. In the seventh century, weakening of Byzantine defenses opened the way to an invasion from Arabia. The Arabs were fired with the religious zeal which they sought to impose on those peoples they overcame. Like Christianity, Islam was a missionary religion. The founder of the faith was Muhammad, born in about 570 in Mecca, a center of trade. Muhammad grew up with the familiarity of Christianity and Judaism. He experienced visions when he believed, which he believed to be revelations from God. In one vision, the archangel Gabriel directed him to convey these messages to his people. Unwelcome in Mecca, Muhammad fled to what is now known as Medina, where his preaching was accepted, and he attracted a following. One of Muhammad's goals was to unite the Arabs under a single faith. The Arabic word for submission is Islam. The word for the submitter is Muslim that is, faith and believer. Muhammad thought of himself as a spiritual leader, although he became a political and military leader as well. He believed, through revelation, that he should use force, if necessary, against unbelievers. 
By the year of his death in 632, he had control over a large portion of Arabia and beyond. We are looking at two leaves from a Quran written in a single column of 12 to 13 lines in Kufic script, likely produced in Egypt. The word Quran derives from a Syriac word for scripture or prayer recitation. The Quran is considered an eternal object, not created in time by any one individual. Early manuscript copies of the Quran, such as this, illustrate the development of a system of diacritical marks to improve vocalization. Black dots placed above or below the letter distinguish between consonants. The red dots mark short vowels. By 720, Muslims had wrested Spain from Christianized Visigoths and were raiding the Pyrenees into France. As powerful as they were, they offered toleration to Jews and Christians. Muhammad set his revelations in the context of Judaism and Christianity, identifying Allah with Yahweh and accepting the line of Jewish prophets from Abraham through Jesus. He taught that his work was the culmination of older monotheistic teachings. In this respect, he positioned himself as not unlike that of Jesus with respect to Judaism. The Quran could be viewed in this light as a sequel to the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. The central spiritual appeal of Islam was its stress on the oneness of God. Most of the Quran describes and praises Allah, the Supreme, the All-Knowing, the All-Powerful. Muhammad's revelations were memorized by his disciples and written down in final form shortly after his death. This is the Quran, written in Arabic and as immutable as Allah. It opens, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. It is short, shorter than the New Testament, and poetic. It is a record of divine inspiration and a strict guide to morality, law, and science. Muhammad's teachings are in the Judeo-Christian tradition. The Quran repeats many of the proverbs and stories in the Bible. Muhammad stressed love, kindness, and compassion. Islamic holy scripture is meant to be recited aloud, either alone or in community. The divine word of God calls for proper recitation. The marks on this manuscript leaf indicate where the reader must pause pause voluntarily, or must not pause. The reliance on proper recitation was one method of memorization through oral transmission. The early state of the written Arabic language would have made uniformity of the scripture difficult. The gradual improvement of consistent written Arabic was complete by the late ninth century. Pictorial representation with written scripture was considered irrelevant to the divine message. The word was all that the devoted needed. However, the development of calligraphy not only transmitted the word of God in written form, but supplied an aesthetic value to that written word. The Muslim world made dramatic advances in agriculture and commerce. Arab rulers supported studies of geography and navigation. They supported popular education. Greek scientific works were translated into Arabic and circulated. Muslim scholars studied Aristotle and Plato, attempting to reconcile their writings with Muhammad's teachings. After having lost for centuries many of the treasures of Greek writings, Western Europeans recovered them through Arabic translations. In the 11th and 12th centuries, growing contact with the Muslim world prompted Latin translations from Greek, Arabic, and Hebrew, works of Hellenistic science, mathematics, and medicine, and original writings and commentaries by leading Muslim scholars, hitherto unknown in Western Europe. In the 11th century, the Persian physician and philosopher Avicenna introduced the works of Aristotle to the Arabs, but Avicenna went beyond translations. His Al-Shifa, healing of the soul, touches upon medicine, logic, mathematics, physics, music, and metaphysics. 
Avicenna formulated that it was from God the Creator that ideas were communicated by divine light to the human body and thus the human soul. This vast encyclopedic work was influential in the development of philosophy and medicine in the East. Through a 13th century Latin translation, it had a profound influence on European medical studies in the West. It was the main textbook of European medicine until the 16th century. Renaissance scholars studied ancient Greek and Roman texts and also medieval Arabic texts. Translations of Arabic works in Latin appeared in several editions within the first 50 years of printing. This is the first printed work in Arabic of Avicenna. The Medici press in Rome developed the first Arabic type. In an age of discovery, it made sense to read works in their original language. By the time the full impact of Aristotle and new learning from the East had reached the universities of Europe and Christian dogma was being challenged by Muslim logicians, a professor at Paris, Thomas Aquinas, adopted Aristotelian logic and skillfully worked it into a defense of his faith. For Aquinas, revealed truth was never in conflict with logic. Both faith and reason were created by God. Aquinas was part of a larger group of intellectuals who devoted time to collecting and organizing knowledge on all topics. These collections were published as summa, or reference books. Aquinas' collection dealt with theological questions. Aquinas established his methodology of logic on a series of pro and con questions, a mode of presentation conventional for the time. His conclusions almost always complied with the teachings of the Catholic Church. Aquinas investigated epistemology, the study of how a person knows something. Aquinas stated that, no, that one knows first through sensory perception of the physical world, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. Secondly, knowledge comes from reason, the mind exercising its natural abilities. The power of human reason to know proved that humans could know God. The natural world, earth, air, trees, water, birds, came from an original source or cause, the creator who started it all. Everything for Aquinas had an essential explanation, a reason for existence. In this way, Aquinas followed Aristotle. Yet, Aquinas paid scant attention to the direct observation of nature that Aristotle stressed and none to experimentation. Aquinas and other medieval philosophers built upon classical learning, reconciled it with Christian teachings, and absorbed new ideas from the Muslim world. Dante, however, put Muhammad, and thus his teachings, in one of the lower circles of his inferno, among the sowers of division. Dante Alighieri came from an old noble Florentine family who had fallen onto hard times. Dante was immersed in the political and intellectual currents of his time. He held several positions in the city government. Factional conflict led to his exile from Florence in 1302. To the end of his life, Dante hoped to return to his beloved home, but never did. His Divine Comedy written between 1313 and 1321, is an allegorical tale describing the experiences of the human soul after death. One hundred cantos, divided equally into three parts, describe the realms of this next world, inferno, or hell, purgatory, and paradise, or heaven. Dante recounts his imaginary journey through these regions in a search for God. Escorted by the classical Roman poet Virgil, who represents reason, Dante travels first to hell, where he observes the torments of the damned and takes the opportunity himself to damn a few personages from his own time, condemning ecclesiastical ambition and corruption. Along with Muhammad, 43 of the 79 people consigned to the hell that Dante visits 
were Florentines of some note. Dante and Virgil move on to purgatory, where the souls of absolved sinners struggle upward. Here, Virgil shows Dante how souls can be purified of their disordered inclinations. Dante is then permitted into paradise, where the blessed enjoy the gifts of God. For this final portion of the journey, Dante must leave the pagan Virgil behind. His guide for paradise is Beatrice, his ideal of Christian womanhood, a fusion of romantic and spiritual love. Beatrice is a woman that Dante had loved in real life, although their meeting was ephemeral. She represents revelation, the only way in which the mysteries of heaven can be known. Beatrice leads Dante to his final guide, St. Bernard, who leads him to the Virgin Mary. Through her grace or intercession, he at last attains a vision of God and salvation. He wrote, the love that moves the sun and other stars. Dante and his readers move from despair to hope to perfection. Dante drew upon the philosophers of the Middle Ages his poem is profoundly Christian, yet contains pointed criticism of some church authorities. The main thesis of Dante's long poem is a fundamental medieval cultural preoccupation, Christian faith and Christian salvation. The theology is that of Thomas Aquinas. Dante perpetuated both the Latin classical and church traditions, but his work presaged the very beginnings of humanistic tendencies. Daringly, Dante is a layman describing theology in the vernacular, not Latin, demonizing two popes in the process. Moreover, using Virgil as his initial guide emphasizes the role of classical tradition in providing wisdom, a theme that becomes important to the Italian humanists. Dante's devotion to the female, at least in the form of the beautiful Beatrice and the Virgin Mary, introduces an opportunity to look at a woman who, no doubt, entered paradise not quite 100 years before Dante was born. The tenth and youngest child of a lesser noble family, her father was a knight. Hildegard was given when eight years old to an abbey in the Rhineland. As a child, she reported having visions. At the abbey, she received a Benedictine education, including an elementary knowledge of Latin. In 1136, she was appointed leader of the Abbey's female community. She possessed leadership and administrative talents, and in 1147, was sent to found a Benedictine convent near Bingen. She oversaw the construction of the building, incorporating features such as plumbing that piped in water. At Bingen, she carried on a vast correspondence with scholars and ordinary people gaining a reputation for wisdom. More than 100 of her letters to emperors, bishops, nuns, and nobility survive. She wrote more than 72 songs and a morality play set to music. This is the earliest liturgical morality play yet to be discovered. She wrote poetry and nine books. Her body of works included the Physica on the physical elements combining botanical and biological observations along with pharmaceutical advice. A book on medicine discusses the symptoms, causes, and cures of physical ailments. She traveled to the University of Paris where the faculty approved of her writings when she was in her mid-70s, bringing with her an armload of books. Within the space of 11 years, Hildegard traveled from Bamberg to Tyr, to Cologne, and throughout Swabia, preaching in public at each stop. Perhaps most astonishing of her achievements was the mere fact that she stood alone among women. There are almost no other writings by women from the time. Women were responsible for only a tiny proportion of 12th century literary output. Many factors mitigated against women writers, yet Hildegard seems to have overcome them all. Indeed, her life is filled with activities in areas where women, if not actually forbidden to participate, were certainly not encouraged. She preached, founded convents, performed exorcisms, healed, 
and wrote. Hildegard's first book was Scivius, a record of her mystical visions, which incorporates her theological learning. In Scivius, Hildegard tackles the concepts of universe, a representation of macrocosm and microcosm, and addresses the process of Christian salvation, which can only be attained through redemption. Hildegard reflects on the works of God and his relation to humanity, the figure of Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Together, these three sections detail 26 visions, which she claimed to have experienced in a conscious state, and that provided her instruction and direction. In 1141, she received a vision in which God commanded her, O fragile one, ash of ash, corruption of corruption, write what you see and hear. Tell people how to enter the kingdom of salvation. Written over the course of 10 years, Hildegard completed Scivius around 1151. In the miniature at the opening of this manuscript, Hildegard writes her visions on a wax tablet balanced on her knee as the flames of the Holy Spirit descend upon her. The monk, her teacher for years, transfers the words from the tablet to parchment. Writing in Hildegard's feminine 12th century meant this. She could form letters, and she had fundamental abilities in reading, but her grasp of written Latin, particularly its grammar, was minimal. Her education had hardly been formal or substantial. Hence, she dictated to two male monks, better educated than she. Hildegard's insistence that she wrote at the command of God is interesting. Male writers of the same century often began their works with the insistence that they only wrote at the command of a superior and that their written works were provided solely as a way to offer useful content to others. Thus, for instance, the written lives of the saints. Writing theology was particularly tricky activity. The authoritative church fathers, Augustine, for example, once commented that any particular part of the Bible from which all theology came could hardly be added to by other voices. Thus, Hildegard's visions in Scivius came strictly from the authority of God. Throughout the work, Hildegard recognizes that wisdom does not come easily. The human struggle consists of confusion, pain, and opposition. Our strengths come from merriment, constancy, justice, compassion, and creativity. Wisdom resides in all creative works, she wrote. The Pope heard of her work and sent Bernard Abbott of Clairvaux to, to investigate. With his recommendation, the Pope gave his approval in a letter, encouraging her to continue writing. Hildegard responded by admonishing him to work toward church reform. Years later, Hildegard's writings were transformed into this manuscript with 35 illuminations inspired by her visions. The manuscript was created in the monastery of Rupertsburg Although the illustrator and the production of the manuscript are debated, the paintings, quite possibly done by the nuns at Rupertsburg and directed by Hildegard herself, offer an extraordinary insight into Hildegard's attitudes toward the feminine divine. The world nearly lost this work. Preserved for centuries, it was taken to Dresden during World War II for safekeeping and has not been seen since. A photocopy had been made in 1927, and between then and 1933, Benedictine nuns produced a complete parchment reproduction of the texts and the illuminations. In contrast to Hildegard's immersive concern with the human soul and its communion with God, Geoffrey Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales, a collection of stories encompassing a broad range of very human themes. Chaucer, whose father was a wine merchant, worked in the administrations of Edward III and Richard II. In this capacity, he traveled extensively on the continent. He was cosmopolitan and urbane, sophisticated and insightful. His tales are a collection of stories exchanged amongst a group of people on a pilgrimage to the Shrine of Canterbury. Like Dante, 
Chaucer, writing in the vernacular, drew heavily from the classical Latin poets. His clear and forceful language helped make his East Midland dialect the chief ancestor of modern English. His tales are represented in lengthy, rhymed narrative. He took his basic form from medieval literary tradition, but emphasized individual characters. The pilgrims are from varied social backgrounds. Their personalities are revealed in the story each tells. Within this group, Chaucer portrays an entire range of English society, the monk, the merchant, the student, the lawyer, the carpenter, the cook, the doctor. There is a Christian knight who tells a chivalric romance, a miller who tells a vulgar story about a deceived husband, the wife of Bath who buries five husbands, the jewelry-wearing prioress who delivers a homily on the Virgin Mary. In all of the tales, Chaucer presents a rich panorama of English social life in the 14th century, reflecting the cultural tensions of the time. Although on a sacred pilgrimage, somewhat reminiscent of Dante's journey, many of Chaucer's pilgrims are materialistic and worldly, suggesting the ambivalence of the broader society's concern for the next world and enjoyment of this one. Chaucer used some of his storytellers to criticize the corruption of the church. Yet Chaucer was a pious Christian who never doubted basic Christian dogma. His rem he remained optimistic that the church could be reformed. This manuscript was produced in the London Scriptorium about 1410 for an affluent patron and is the most complete version of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. The manuscript contains 23 portraits of the storytellers, including one of Chaucer himself. The artist's representations of the pilgrims follow closely Chaucer's description of them and are among the earliest examples of English portrait painting. Chaucer died leaving the tales in an unfinished state. The scribes left space in two tales, the cooks and the squires, in the hope that the remaining text would be discovered and inserted later. Like most medieval manuscripts, the Ellesmere Chaucer was written on vellum, most likely made from calfskin. The largest calfskins measured about two feet by three feet after they had been prepared for use. A skin this size would have made four leaves or eight pages of the size of the Ellesmere leaves. Thus, it took at least 58 of the largest skins to make up the pages of this manuscript, an expensive proposition and one only available to someone of great wealth. The 16th century ushered in a phenomenally active period of Western European expansion into the Americas, Africa, and Asia. This world map was first issued in 1540, the second version in 1550, identifiable by the inclusion of the engraver's initials in the lower left. In the second version, the east and west winds do not protrude into the map image as on the earlier map. Cartographic information had changed considerably from the Ptolemaic world map. The most obvious difference is the inclusion of the New World, complete with the false sea of Verrazano, which gave expression to the desire for a westward route to the Orient. All across the map are reflections of recent European voyages. Africa, while still retaining Ptolemy's depiction of the source of the Nile in the Mountains of the Moon, is shown with an approximately accurate shape, the land bridge to Asia having disappeared. The outline of Asia is also much improved, with India and Ceylon taking on more of their true proportions, and there is indication of the many islands off Southeast Asia. With one face turned toward the future, this map also continues to face the past, its fantastic border showing the twelve winds and numerous sea monsters. From the second century to the sixteenth century, writers criticized in one way and to one extent or another perceived corruption within church and government. A little more than a century after Chaucer died, those criticisms became impetus for Thomas More. While Chaucer wrote Canterbury Tales in his English dialect, Moore wrote his visionary Utopia in Latin, the language of scholarship and science. 
And while Chaucer accepted the chaos of human characteristics with humor, Moore attempted to order that chaos with an overarching social system that varied greatly from the one in existence. Like Chaucer, Moore worked as a civil servant and saw problems not only with the way the Catholic Church was run, but with the way secular life was run as well. Moore despised the grasping, callous landlords and entrepreneurs of his day. For his utopia, he envisioned a planned society of common ownership, tolerance, and equality. His vision influenced socialist thinkers into the 19th century. A profoundly religious man, Moore trained as a lawyer, but was interested in classical learning and became proficient in both Latin and Greek. Like the Italian humanists who believed in putting their learning at the service of the state, he entered upon a public career that ultimately took him to the highest reaches of power as Lord Chancellor of England. In serving King Henry VIII, Moore came face to face with government abuses and corruption. Under the king, he was sent as an ambassador to Flanders, and while there, he wrote Utopia in 1516, presenting a revolutionary view of society. Utopia means nowhere, described a community on an island somewhere off the mainland of the New World. In Utopia, all the children received a good education, primarily in the Greco-Roman classics. Learning did not cease with maturity. Adults divided their days equally between manual labor or business pursuits and various intellectual activities. Because the profits from business and property were held in common, there was social equality. The utopians used gold and silver to make chamber pots and to prevent wars by buying off their enemies. By this casual use of precious metals, Moore suggested that the basic problems in society were caused by greed. All persons worked only six hours per day, regardless of occupation, and then were given abundant leisure time to pursue enriching activities. Utopian law exalted mercy above justice. Citizens of Utopia led a nearly perfect existence because they lived by cooperation and reason. Power was no longer the motivating social agent. Moore punned on the word utopia, which he termed a good place, a good place, which is no place. Moore's ideas were profoundly original in the 16th century. Contrary to the long prevailing view that vice and violence exist because women and men are basically corrupt, Moore maintained that acquisitiveness and private property promoted those vices. According to Moore, the key to improvement and reform of the individual was reform of social institutions. Moore did not allow his utopian idealism to outweigh the reality of his life. He justified his service to the king, but his religious devotion and belief in Catholic church doctrine proved even more important than that service. A man of conscience, Moore willingly gave up his life opposing England's breach with his beloved church over Henry VIII's divorce. Moore saw clearly to the heart of the issue. Loyalty to the Pope in Rome was treason in England. He could not accept the national state over the church, nor would he, as a Christian, bow his head to a secular ruler in matters of faith. For his stance, he was beheaded. The book we are looking at here is an incomplete anthology of the works of Thomas More. It includes the original Latin text of Utopia and is likely the fourth Latin printing of the work. This edition also includes History of Richard III, on which Shakespeare based his play, a piece More wrote while imprisoned in the Tower of London. One year after Thomas More's Utopia was published, a German priest, Martin Luther, made his own objections to the church known. His objections changed Christianity forever. In the manuscript era, with limited literacy and limited distribution of expensive books, those criticisms could be met with some quietude. 
the development of the printing press with its consequent multiple copies of texts and broad reach to the masses changed relative tranquility into uproar. In 1517, Martin Luther, like others before him, protested in a long list of criticisms and provoked dissent and rebellion among the laity. Although Luther wrote the list by hand, it was quickly printed and distributed throughout Germany. Confronted by the Pope, Luther began to question the basic authority of the papacy. Luther, a man of German peasant stock, was also the product of a long spiritual pilgrimage marked by doubt, agony, and finally conviction. It was not Luther's intention to create and foment a break with the church, but that is eventually what happened. These images are from a copy of one of only two editions of this collection of 13 sermons by Martin Luther, a supplement to an earlier edition of 27 sermons. These two collections, along with a third published in 1522, were part of one of the most important projects of Luther's career, the creation of a postal for the Reformed Church. The early printed sermons represent Luther's own vision of the postal, a term used in medieval Europe for biblical commentary derived from the Latin term post il verba textus, or after these words. Later, postal referred to homiletic exposition as opposed to thematic sermonizing. By the mid 14th century, the term was applied to an, an annual cycle of homilies. In early 16th century Roman Catholic preaching, especially in Germany, postals were commonly used. Luther published his as replacements for those used by the Catholic Church. This edition is illustrated with a historiated woodcut title page border, thought to be by Hans Baldung Grien, a student of Albrecht Dürer. The page includes putti, unicorns, lions, stags, and the printer's monogram. A full portrait of Luther faces the beginning of the text, which also contains a small image of Christ. The portrait of Luther, as first published by the same printer in 1521, included a halo surrounding Luther's head, a symbol of sainthood. The fact that the halo was removed in the second edition, printed only a year later, suggests the swiftness of Reformation theological departure from Roman Catholic notions of the spiritual power of church leaders. The printer, Johann Schott, took another printer to court in 1533 over the reprinting of one of his illustrated books, An Herbal. The case is the first reprint suit documented in the Holy Roman Empire, an example of how the commerce of printing changed notions of proprietary law, that is, copyright, for the written word, and for art, for artists, artists, and publishers. In search of spiritual peace, Luther latched on to one passage in the New Testament in particular, St. Paul's Roman epistle in which he admonished, the just shall live by faith. Good works in the form of indulgences so rampant now in the church were not enough, could never in fact be enough. No human, each weak and powerless in the sight of Almighty God, could do enough to justify his or her salvation. We are saved not by works, but by faith alone, said Luther. From this faith comes a desire to perform good works, not because we need to, but because we want to. From this, Luther concluded, there was no need for priesthood, penance, or pilgrimage. In 1520, the Pope excommunicated Luther. Luther responded by burning the bull the papal announcement of that excommunication. He was further branded as an outlaw. He was secretly kept in safety in the German Prince Frederick's castle, where he worked for a year on a German translation of the Bible. He spent the rest of his life organizing and administering a new church, reflecting new interpretations of scripture and thereby church doctrine. But he was conservative in his social views.
We are looking at images from writings by Luther on behalf of Leonard Kaiser. Kaiser spread Martin Luther's message through letters and books that he sent to friends. While visiting his dying father in 1527, he was arrested, imprisoned, and interrogated for openly preaching Lutheran doctrine. Charges against him included teaching justification through faith alone and other heresies like disapproval of confession and other sacraments, purgatory, the invocation of saints, and the power of the papacy. Kaiser was burned at the stake. While Kaiser was in prison, Luther sent him a letter of consolation. This book contains Luther's letter to Kaiser, a preface and conclusion, and a letter from Elector John of Saxony to the Bishop of Passau, appealing for clemency on Kaiser's behalf. Kaiser's execution quickly became infamous. This book was printed nine times in quick succession. Luther abolished the veneration of saints and relics. He abolished monastic orders and permitted ministers to marry. In this way, he believed, he raised the value of marriage and upheld the rights of wives. Yet, Luther was also clear that a wife's role included obedience to her husband and to bear children. Family life was a woman's destiny. In this wedding sermon preached by Luther for an unnamed couple, he used a verse from Hebrews 13, marriage should be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will punish whores and adulterers. Luther's sermon is a dark warning at a presumably joyous occasion to beware the temptations of boredom curiosity, and lust as threats to the sanctity of married life. Luther wrote, those who are outside the marital estate and lead, lead immoral lives, such as pimps, think marriage is nothing, but they despise and denigrate both God's word and this estate, no matter how pious they pretend to be. The married couple are to make sure that they are careful to keep the marriage bed pure and unstained, which means that the wife keeps to her husband and the husband lets himself be contented with his wife. Where this does not happen, God's word, the beautiful jewel, is befouled with the devil's filth and the marital bed is stained. If instead one is mindful of God's word, it will create fear and hesitation or actually loathing and horror at the thought of adultery. God's word would adorn your wife so that even if she is hideous and hostile, impatient and obstinate, she will be more dear to you because of the word and will please you more than if she were adorned with vanity and gold. From the gutter of adultery and the horror of an odious wife, Luther elevates and edifies the beset husband. For no adornment is above the word of God, through which you look upon your wife as a gift from God. The new religious structure brought about by Martin Luther was not Europe's only break from the past. The 16th century also brought about a new perception of fields that had been dominated by Greek thought throughout the late Middle Ages. Medicine, for instance, until the 16th century was still very much guided by the teachings of Aristotle and Galen, a second century physician. Two figures in particular are associated with changes in medicine that occurred in the 16th century. Paracelsus was born near Zurich, Switzerland, one year after Columbus first landed in Hispaniola. His father was a physician. In 1502, after the death of his mother, Paracelsus moved with the rest of his family to a mining town where his father combined his interests in chemistry and medicine with his patients' experiences in the mines and smelting plants. Paracelsus traveled widely and possibly received a medical degree from the University of Ferrara. If he did, he was quick to disavow his academic education. He was appointed physician and professor of medicine at Basel in 1527, but was dismissed due to his vanity, arrogance, quick temper, and generally cantankerous nature. 
He was kicked out of Basel for throwing a copy of Avicenna's works on, into a bonfire. Worse than that, his patient, the noted publisher Johannes Freuben, died under his care. Paracelsus did not disguise his contempt for universities and the physicians that emerged from them. He rejected the work of both Aristotle and Galen and attacked the academy for its insistent clinging to the ancients. He attempted to replace the tradition with a new system based upon observation and experiment. Paracelsus believed that the universe could be visible to every enlightened layperson and that it had to be understood independently of classical and biblical tradition. He viewed the human body as a small replica of the larger world around it. Paracelsus, the man renamed himself this, taking Celsus, the name of an ancient physician, and adding para, or greater than, in front of it, believed that the chemical reactions of the universe as a whole were reproduced in human beings on a smaller scale. Disease, then, was not caused by the Galenic imbalance of the four humors, but was due to chemical influences that were localized in specific organs and could be treated by chemical remedies. Having rejected the humoral theory of Galenic medicine, Paracelsus also rejected the traditional Galenic remedies prepared from herbs based on the work of Dioscorides. Although others had used chemical remedies, Paracelsus differed from them in giving careful attention to the proper dosage of his chemically prepared metals and minerals. Paracelsus favored an ancient Germanic folk principle that like cures like. The poison that caused a disease would be its cure if used in proper form and quantity. In fact, Paracelsus had a good reputation for actually curing his patients. Antimony was used as a purgative to cure Louis XIV. Even so, this use of toxic substances like mercury and lead to cure patients was viewed by Paracelsus's detractors, of whom there were many, as the practice of a homicide physician. A contemporary of Leonardo, Martin Luther, and Nicholas Copernicus, the reputation of Paracelsus as the founder of chemistry rests upon this work. This book links medieval alchemy and the rise of modern chemistry in the 16th century. Although Pliny the Elder and Dioscorides developed procedures for distilling vegetable substances, this work is a landmark in the development of chemistry as a scientific subject. Paracelsus classified all chemical operations and materials known to him. He was particularly careful in documenting the medicinal use of his chemical preparations, adding to knowledge of compounds. He invented ether. He invented laudanum, a tincture of opium, used in pharmacopoeia into the 20th century and abused during the same time. He was a prolific writer, but most of his work was not printed until after his death, first published in the Latin translation in Krakow in 1569. Six more editions of this work were printed in 1570. The text for this German edition follows his manuscript source more faithfully than did other previous editions. Like Paracelsus, Andreas Vesalius challenged the authority of Galen. Vesalius's study of medicine at the University of Paris involved him in the works of Galen, that great ancient authority. After receiving a doctorate in medicine at the University of Padua in 1536, Vesalius accepted a position there as professor of surgery. In 1543, his masterpiece was published on the fabric of the human body, published the same year Copernicus published his heliocentric theory, a book condemned by Martin Luther. This book was based on his lectures, in which he deviated from traditional practice by personally dissecting a body to illustrate what he was discussing. Vesalius was the physician to Charles V, 
a position which gave him strong patronage and a steady supply of cadavers for dissection. Vesalius's anatomical treatise presented a careful examination of the individual organs and general structure of the human body. The illustrations relate precisely to the text. The sequence of illustration from skeleton to various muscle layers and nerves succeeded in clarifying the study of the human body to a degree never before achieved. The book would not have been feasible without the artistic advances of the day. A number of artists, including possibly the Venetian master Titian, created the drawings for the woodcuts using the newly discovered scientific principle of linear perspective. Technical developments in the art of printing also made a difference. Together, they made possible the creation of illustrations superior to any hitherto produced. Vesalius's approach to teaching anatomy enabled him to overthrow some of Galen's most glaring errors. For example, he corrected Galen's assertion that the great blood vessels originated from the liver his observations made it clear that they came from the heart. Nevertheless, Vesalius clung to a number of Galen's erroneous assertions, including the Greek physician's ideas on the circulation of the blood. We are looking at the second edition of Vesalius's anatomy. Vesalius added to the second edition corrections, additions, and new information, which later enabled the discovery of the circulating nature of blood. The foundations of modern science were set out by Francis Bacon in this book, Novum Organum. Born in the England of Elizabeth I and working as a civil servant, Bacon advanced a new method of reasoning. Bacon argued convincingly against reliance on the ancients, especially Aristotle, whose teachings practiced in Western Europe throughout the Middle Ages would not work for science. Bacon wrote, it must be plainly avowed that that wisdom which we have derived principally from the Greeks is but like the boyhood of knowledge and has the characteristic of boys. It can talk, but it cannot generate, for it is fruitful of controversies, but barren of works. Bacon wrote that experimentation was necessary to determine truth. He said, the entire fabric of human reason which we employ in the inquisition of nature is badly put together and built up and like some magnificent structure without foundation. He criticized existing methods of scientific interpretation as inadequate and provided a system based upon accurate observations and the accumulation of reliable data. He urged scientists to record their experiments and to exchange their ideas as a matter of mutual assistance. Bacon was no scientist. He rejected the work of Copernicus and Kepler and misunderstood Galileo, but he called for a new way of knowing the natural world. The engraved image on the title page of this book was prophetic. In 1620, the course of philosophy with Bacon as pilot was substantially altered. Sailing through the pillars of Hercules, the Straits of Gibraltar, the limits of the old world, Bacon's ship sets out into new and uncharted seas, leaving behind a legacy of superstition and credulity. This voyage, as daring and influential as any undertaken by Renaissance explorers, ushered in a new era. Although the discoveries of Copernicus, Galileo, and others did much to destroy the pervasive influence of Aristotle, it was this work that established a new philosophical structure in Western Europe. The overthrow of the ancients, like that of Galen by Paracelsus and Vesalius, was completed by Galileo when he overthrew Aristotle's theory of the universe. Following in the keen observational footsteps of Vesalius, Galileo constructed a telescope in 1609 that could be used to examine the heavens. 
It was a lead tube about three feet long with a two inch lens that had been invented a few years earlier. Crude and low powered, it nonetheless revealed a world of bodies as unknown until then as the human body had been only a few decades before. With his telescope, Galileo observed that the planets were not mere points of light, but bodies of dimension like the moon. He discovered mountains and craters on the moon. He discovered the moons of Jupiter. He saw sunspots. He recognized the incredible distances of the objects he was seeing. He saw tens of thousands of stars never seen before. He saw Venus go through phases that corresponded to its position with respect to the sun and the earth, proving that Copernicus's heliocentric theory was correct. The comprehensible closed universe of the Greeks and Christians vanished before his eyes. The universe was no longer ethereal, but just as material as the earth. Both the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches all condemned Galileo's views. Christian authority and doctrine were linked to the earth-centered Ptolemaic theory of the solar system. Galileo's discoveries contradicted both scripture and sacred tradition. While Martin Luther's cohort, Philip Melanchthon, had earlier condemned Copernicus's work, the Catholic Church had remained mostly silent and had not denounced Copernicus, although it had placed an injunction not to hold or to defend Copernican doctrine. Galileo defended that doctrine. Written in vernacular Italian rather than scholarly Latin, and thereby making his book more widely available to the public, Galileo published Dialogo or Dialogue on the Two Chief Systems in 1632. Galileo's dialogue or conversation took place between three men, a supporter of Aristotle and Ptolemy, an open-minded layman, and a proponent of Copernicus. The Copernicus defender clearly wins the argument. The first printing of this book numbered 1,000 copies and sold out before the end of the year. Galileo fell into trouble after publishing Dialogo. A year after its publication, he was charged with heresy, brought before the Inquisition, and threatened with torture. He recanted the views he expressed in Dialogo. The book was placed on the index but the ideas expressed in it continued to spread. For his part, Galileo, a devout Catholic, saw little need to pit science against religion. For him, it made no sense for the church to determine the nature of physical reality on the basis of biblical texts that were subject to divergent interpretations. The influential Grand Duchess Christina of Lorraine Mother of Galileo's pupil, Prince Cosimo, was a devoutly religious woman. Because of Galileo's connection with her son, and later her grandson, she developed a fondness for Galileo that withstood her displeasure at what she saw as a discrepancy between Holy Scripture and Galileo's science. In 1614, Galileo wrote a letter to a colleague addressing the concerns the Grand Duchess had regarding Copernicus's statement that the sun, not the earth, was the center of the universe. The letter was copied and circulated in spite of Galileo's fears that it would fall into unsympathetic hands, which indeed it did. He rewrote the letter in 1615, turning it into a lengthy defense of his work and views. He used an Augustinian perspective to justify his support of Copernican heliocentrism, suggesting it was not necessarily contrary to church doctrine. The suggestion here is that there could be compromise between literal translation of scripture and contrary observed astronomical phenomena, or one could take an allegorical stand on scripture Either one of these could resolve conflicts arising between observation and the validity of scripture. 
The letter continued to have a wide readership in manuscript form. No printer dared publish it until 1636. This Latin version was printed by Elia Diodati under the pseudonym of Roberto Robertini. This posthumous work by René Descartes is the first European textbook of physiology. Descartes, a brilliant mathematician, sought to solve the central question around which almost all philosophical thought had revolved since the time of Aristotle, the relation between the soul and the body. Mathematical reasoning could arrive at the truth. Of his study, Descartes wrote, first, I must describe the body on its own, then the soul, again on its own, and finally, I must show how these two natures would have to be joined and united in order to constitute men who resemble us. Descartes believed that the relationship between the soul and the body was mediated by the brain and the nervous system. He attempted to explain neural mechanisms drawing on engineering developments, such as hydraulic automata of his time. He developed a hydromechanical theory of how the soul controlled the contraction of muscle through the intermediary of the pineal and cerebral ventricles, and he produced an explanation of how it received, through the nerves from the periphery, signals that gave rise to sensation. Descartes proposed a mechanical universe, ruling mind, body, and soul, and subject to unvarying mathematical rules. For Descartes, the existence of God, the nature of the soul, how bodies functioned, in fact, the universe, the sun, the moon, and the stars worked according to the same reasoning and logic. This work was written in the 1630s, but after the condemnation of Galileo in 1633, Descartes dared not publish it. After his death, several copies of his manuscript circulated among his friends. This first printed version was translated from French into Latin by Florentius Scheuel. Scheuel was a professor of philosophy in a small town in the Netherlands, a country in which Descartes had lived. Two of Descartes' friends had copies of the manuscript which they supplied to Scheuel. One of these had two sketches, apparently in Descartes' own hand. It was clear that Descartes had intended for the work to be further illustrated. He refers to figures and to features within these labeled with letters. But other than the two, no set of figures accompanied the manuscripts. It is believed that Scheuel contributed the designs for the other illustrations. His edition is illustrated with 56 woodcuts and engraved plates. In 1633, René Descartes was poised to publish Le Monde when he heard that Galileo had been condemned by Rome for the views he expressed in Dialogo regarding the Copernican theory that the earth revolves around the sun. Descartes received a copy of Dialogo in 1634, two years after its publication and one year after its ban from a friend Descartes also supported the Copernican model and said so in Le Monde. He stopped publication of Le Monde, hoping that the Roman Catholic Church would retract its condemnation of Galileo. Le Monde was never published in his lifetime. It turned out to be one of the last scientific works he wrote before he moved on to philosophy in part perhaps because he was genuinely concerned about contradicting his church with scientific heresy. The first edition of Le Monde was based upon a copy of the original manuscript. An edition based upon the original manuscript was published in 1677. From Descartes' correspondence, it appears that Le Monde was meant to be part of a single treatise. Descartes wrote to a friend that his intention with this work was to explain all the phenomena of nature. Science had become an international phenomenon, although there were cultural clashes. 
French followers of Descartes vied with English Newtonians. Descartes hoped to use mathematical rigor to reason out a complete system of truths that would explain everything in the whole world. Isaac Newton eliminated the barrier between earthly mechanics and celestial mechanics and established by mathematical proof the existence of universal laws. Although Copernicus and Galileo had shown the way by describing the phenomena they observed, Newton explained the underlying universal laws of those phenomena. Newton established scientific method as a lucid union of Baconian and Cartesian theory. His own theories overthrew the subjective interpretations of nature that had dominated science and natural philosophy since Aristotle. His system of the world remained unchallenged until Einstein published his theory of relativity three centuries later. A brilliant astronomer and mathematician, Newton invented calculus, broke white light into its component colors, and built a telescope whose design is still used today. When he was 47, he published Mathematica Principia, the book that changed the way we see the world. Principia gave us the three laws of motion, defined gravity, and provided the precise mathematical equations by which it could be measured. It is likely that no more than 300 copies of the first edition of this book were printed. Edmund Halley was instrumental in getting Principia into print. Halley wheedled, flattered, and bullied Newton, a recluse, into preparing his manuscript. Halley paid the cost of printing out of his own pocket. In the 17th century, Alexander Pope wrote, Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, Let Newton be, and all was light. In the 18th century, William Wordsworth wrote of Newton, forever voyaging through strange seas of thought alone. In the 20th century, Albert Einstein said that Newton determined the course of Western thought, research, and practice like no one else before or since. In the 21st century, Principia is still considered one of the greatest single contributions in the history of science. By the 17th century, the telescope, first Galileo's, then Newton's, had an enduring impact on European notions of God's universe, now made more majestic than ever believed. The microscope had an impact on the European view of God's smaller world. In the course of Antony van Leeuwenhoek's long life, his observations with the microscope achieved widespread popularity and were seen as powerful demonstrations of the almightiness of the Lord in even the tiniest creatures. Born in Delft, von Leeuwenhoek began studying these tiny creatures with his own microscopic lenses in 1670. With his matchless microscopes, he studied just about anything that crept or flew his way. Bees, lice, mites, mosquitoes, fleas, wasps, butterflies, scorpions, or crossed his path. Rainwater, a piece of wood, blood, hair, his own excrement. He discovered human and animal spermatozoa, totally unknown and inconceivable, no pun intended, until then. He observed the red corpuscles of the blood and the circulation of the blood in capillaries, this in the tail of a tadpole, comparing the incredible sight of it as when with the naked eye we see the water leaping high out of a fountain and then falling down again. He was the first to distinguish bacteria. He identified all that he found with his own drawings. He made notes on his findings, which he sent in the form of letters to all sorts of people, often jumping from one subject to another for nearly 50 years. Van Leeuwenhoek had a minimum of education. He did not know any foreign languages, 
and he had a skimpy knowledge of scientific literature. He was introduced to the London's Royal Society with this comment, our honest citizen is a person unlearned in both sciences and languages, but of his own nature exceedingly curious and industrious. The Royal Society announced his discoveries in issues of its journal, Philosophical Transactions. Van Leeuwenhoek disparaged the idle talk of Aristotle. He was fairly indifferent to religion. He wrote that he was unable to understand the perfection of the construction of insects, but very rarely attributed that perfection to an almighty architect. Still, the topic of creator was present. Others would add a religious component to his discoveries. The Royal Society was filled with many who had a religious motivation to carry out research on nature. And Van Leeuwenhoek wrote to one admirer, we cannot glorify the Lord and maker of the all more than by seeing with the greatest admiration his supreme wisdom and perfection revealed in all things, however small they may be, to our naked eye. Van Leeuwenhoek was visited by a parade of princes, scientists, and the curious until his death. The quality of his microscopes was not equaled until the 19th century. His work encouraged lay persons to look through the instruments and see God's creative mightiness in the minuscule of the everyday. The world, as one contemporary of Van Leeuwenhoek wrote, could be regarded as nothing but a book, easily accessible and open to all. And in this book, there was nothing so small that it does not display God's greatness. Printer Heinrich von Kroenewald's shop was right next door to Antoni van Leeuwenhoek's house. The frontispiece of his book depicts in full enlightenment style the power of scientific observation to uncover the mysteries of nature and the power of the press to make it known. The thinkers, writers, and bookmakers of the late Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the 16th and 17th centuries spent an enormous amount of energy trying to make sense of things. With the advent of the printing press and the development of instruments such as the telescope and microscope, the world revealed endless surprises. The natural world was a divine text in which everything was new. Everything we see is very different from what it seems declared the 17th century polymath Athanasios Kircher, the world was an open book, a world without end. For more about rare books, its collections and services, you can visit our website where you can subscribe to our blog, Open Book, scroll through our digital exhibitions and view more virtual lectures. Want to hold these books in your hands? Schedule an appointment at the Special Collections Reading Room. Want to know more? Contact us. Thank you.